Hi and welcome back to another video here on my channel. We have two projects we want to talk about in today's video. First of all, starting with the Aros C690 Aros Extreme. Not sure why it's twice in name, but that's what we want to talk about. Just the main board, what it has to offer in terms of features, the cooling capability on the VRMs and everything, M.2 cooler, all kinds of stuff should be quite interesting talking about the board itself alone. And then there's something that has been interesting to me since the 12900K made it to the market. And that is comparing the 12900K to a 5950X when it comes to FPS per watt. Because even though there have been good reviews, which were talking about the 12900K in the gaming scenario and the power consumption in the gaming scenario, I'm still missing, or I'm not sure if I missed it and other people already did it, but I want to see how much power does the 12900K draw versus a 5950X in certain games. I already performed testing in three games with the 5950X in Battlefield 2042, in Far Cry 6 and also in PUBG. I measured the FPS and also the power draw in these three games and then we are going to compare this data with the 12900K. I absolutely have no idea what the result will be, but we will find out in today's video. Sonic, the heart of your system. Let's get straight to the board. And there are several things I want to talk about. First of all, when I just unpacked the board, the first thing I noticed was this M.2 cooling block. And I think this looks really amazing. Especially if you compare this to other M.2 like cooling solutions, which are essentially just like metal covers for the M.2. If you compare this, for example, with a drive like this, a lot of those M.2 covers end up having a lot less surface area than a cooler like this. That's why I'm very curious about the thermal results using this M.2 cooling block. A lot of fins in there, also heat pipes in there, that looks very, very promising. And one thing I immediately noticed when I touched the board, like on these surfaces and these surfaces, this is metal. This is not plastic anymore, because like just speaking from the past, I was never a fan of those like mainboard covers because most of the time they were just full out plastic. And I'm not a fan of that because it, it never helps anything. It barely helps stability and like thermally it makes absolutely no sense. There have been mainboards in the past which called it, I don't know, like thermal protection, armor, whatever. And it was just plastic. This never helped, but this is metal, like everywhere. This entire thing and even this part above right here is metal. That is really awesome. Looking at the VRM cooling solution, I have good expectations. I think it should be just the same as on the C490 and C590 board. The Aros boards always delivered when it came to VRM thermals. So that should be a good thing. I have good hope about that. But then there's this part. And I'm not sure what to think about this. First of all, this, it, it is just a piece of plastic. Like, it, it feels like it's five euro. And it does not align with the rest of the quality of this board. Like everything else feels really extremely high quality. It feels really good. And then you have this piece, I don't know. It is supposed to be a memory cover. And then, I mean, just if I start from just aligning this piece of plastic right, right here, you will immediately see it doesn't fit on the right. So you will have to already bend this slightly so it fits on the right. And this is because it's plastic. If they made it out of aluminium, it could be better. At least the tolerances should be much more in line than this. But in general, I don't understand the concept of this. It just doesn't make any sense. You don't have to get RGB memory, right? But just look at these Ventions modules. I think like visually they should align perfectly with this board. And if you have like higher DDR5 RGB modules, you will not be able to use this. Like with Dominator modules, for example, you will not be able to fit this on. But if you use these types of sticks, you could use it. But then I think they, they look fine. There is no need to hide them. These are not ugly sticks. That's why I don't understand why they even came up with this. And we will test if it has an influence on the thermals of the memory sticks. The I.O. area of this board is more than sufficient. We have Wi-Fi, we have 2.5G network and 10G network, a total of 10 times USB 3.2 type A and also dual Thunderbolt 4 aka USB Type-C right here. 
Looking at the buttons, we have OZ ignition, which cuts off the CPU power supply, which means that, for example, in a certain state, you don't want your CPU to be active. For example, if you're filling in your water cooling loop or if you're doing extreme overclocking for debugging, the OZ ignition button can be very helpful. QFlash Plus to flash your BIOS without even using a CPU. That can be also very helpful. CMOS clear button, in my opinion, is too small, especially for debugging purposes. And when you're overclocking with liquid nitrogen, for example, this should be easier accessible. So yeah, I can kind of understand why they covered it. So you might not touch it accidentally, but this should be easier to access, I think. Identical to the previous generation Aurospores, all the connectors have to be accessed from the right side, which I think personally is nice, but you have to have the correct case to also make use of this. None of the connectors can be accessed from the bottom, which is okay, but you have to have the correct case to make use of this. Otherwise, it doesn't have a huge amount of SATA ports, but I guess that's okay nowadays. It has plenty of USB 3.0 for cases, that's good, plenty of fan connectors, and then we have this weird thing right here which is like an ATX power connector cover it's also made out of plastic and it makes it a little bit more difficult to release the latch from the ATX 24 pin cable I'm not so sure what to think of this I don't think you have to hide the ATX connector so that's maybe not necessary and I'm not sure how long this will survive because this is plastic and I'm not sure if I keep bending this if it eventually will break off but so far it's still alive. We will now disassemble the board piece by piece simply to check all the connectors which are sitting underneath and also of course the VRMs. This cooler is quite impressive. Forgot to peel off the foil I think but thermally I think this is amazing. In total, you can mount up to four M.2 drives inside this motherboard and what I really like is, I mean, this entire thing is aluminium. It's just one solid piece. Nice. The back of the board is now naked. Here we have the back plate. I first assumed this would be steel because of the stiffness, but then it's not magnetic. Could still be that it's stainless steel, which might not be magnetic, but in the end, um, just judging by the weight, I think it should be aluminium. It's very thin, so it will not do much for the thermals, but it should help, especially for the backside of the CPU VRMs. We have some thermal pads right here and a tinier thermal pad to cover the backside of the 10G network chip. To further disassemble the board and remove the parts from the front, you also have to remove these standoffs from the back. After removing all those additional screws, you can remove the front cover, which also holds the debug LED in place. I mean, this is totally fine for any everyday usage, but for liquid nitrogen overclocking, I'm not sure if you would use this board for that, because you would remove such things, like such covers. You would get rid of them, because you have to check if there's like condensation or anything underneath. For that, you would remove them. But in that case, you would not have a debug LED, which is not great. But for any like everyday usages, this would not matter. PCH heatsink is rather big, should have good thermals. This is a dual phase thermal pad, which means that it will become more soft and liquid once it's getting warm, which also means that if you rip it off like I did for just looking at the cooling block, you should apply additional paste before putting it back on. Unfortunately, I cannot assemble the rest of my system right now because Sheik decided the keyboard is a very nice pillow. This VRM heatsink is crazy and not the heatsink alone but the entire thing. Usually it's easy to take them apart and then you will only have the cooling block itself but the entire thing is almost one piece. Even the audio solution in there is integrated. You can see the thermal pads have proper contact with all of the power stages, which is a good sign. So the thermals with this, pretty sure, pretty confident that the thermals will be quite nice. Underneath the heatsink, we can spot this massive 20 phase VRM design. 20 phases for the CPU V core, and then we have plus one, plus two for the other voltages like the fiber. Sorry, Sheik, uh, I need this back. I spent about 30 minutes of benchmarking, kept hardware info open in the background to track temperatures. The modules, the demodules peaked out at about 50 degrees Celsius 
and the SSD maxed out at about 59 degrees Celsius. I also have to add that I performed in addition five times sequential read-write tests with Crystal Disk Mark on the SSD and VRM temperature of the board peaked out at 60 degrees Celsius. Compared to other C690 boards, this is a bit more subtle, doesn't have as much RGB lightning, which I think is also quite cool. It's only a bit on the IO area right here and a bit on the bottom, which I think is still quite good. I wonder how much it will change adding this, especially when it comes to temperatures. A bit annoying on the MP600 XT, all the thermal pads are completely falling apart if you try to remove this from its original heatsink. I have to admit, it looks much better than I thought. I also think it looks better than having the naked memory exposed. I just think this looks better. But it also looks different, like this material looks different to this one, which I don't think is nice considering the price. This should look the same, but you can see that this is a bit lighter because of this being plastic, this being metal. Now also changed the M.2 cooler. Let's see how this has an impact on performance. I'm done with all the benchmarks and I want to... I'm done with all the benchmarks. Let's take a look at the temperatures of the SSD. You can see there's a significant improvement of about 8 degrees Celsius in the maximum temperature of our Corsair MP600 Pro XT. I repeated exactly the same testing as previously, also ran five times the Crystal Disk Mark sequential read-write test, maximum 51 degrees Celsius. That is a really good value. The memory temperature slightly increased by about 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. It's not significant, but you can measure it. Now let's look at our data of our performance per watt comparison. You already know the first setup. The second setup is a 5950X on the Crosshair 8 Dark Hero. Both setups are using 32 gigabyte of memory dual channel. The DDR5 setup is using 6000C38, while the DDR4 setup is using 3600C18. Both are using an identical installation with Windows 11. Starting off with PUBG 1080p, we will only take a look at the average FPS for this comparison. The 5950X consumed 110 watts, delivering about 450 FPS, while the 12900K draw 84 watt on average, delivering almost 480 FPS on average. Translating this in FPS per watt means the 5950X delivered 4 FPS per watt and the 12900K delivered almost 6 FPS per watt. In 4K we see a very similar picture, 113 watt power draw on average with the 5950X delivering 410 FPS, 12900K 91 watt with 435 FPS, resulting in 3.6 FPS per watt for the 5950X and 4.8 FPS per watt for the 12900K. I also want to point out in this situation that those results are much different than I expected. I expected the 5950X to not beat the 12900K, but be quite a bit better. I'm not sure why this is the case. I performed all the measurements twice, both on the 12900K and the 5950X. I'm still a bit skeptical about these results, but it seems like these are the results for my two setups. Obviously, they always depend on the individual CPU and also the individual mainboard, but these are just the results I have. Battlefield 2042 is quite interesting in 1080p high. Both CPUs perform exactly the same, while the 12900K draws almost 20 watt less. Translated, it means that the 5950X delivers about 1 FPS per watt and the 12900K delivers about 1.2 FPS per watt. Very similar result in 4K with ultra settings identical performance while the 12900K draws 13 watt less than the 5950X, which means the 5950X has about 0.8 FPS per watt, while the 12900K delivers about 0.9 FPS per watt. In Far Cry 6 1080p high setting, we can see a rather big difference between the two CPUs. We have about 20 watt power consumption difference, while the 5950X delivers about 117 FPS and the 12900K 135 FPS, which means we have about 1.1 FPS per watt on the 5950X and 1.6 on the 12900K, so that is a rather huge difference. But if we switch to 4K, higher resolution, the load is switched much more to the GPU and we can see only a tiny performance difference, 93 on average for 5950X, 99 for 12900K. Translates in 0.9 FPS per watt for the 5950X and about 1.1 FPS per watt for 12900K. 
The C690 Aorus Extreme is very solid, like literally, especially with all these metal covers that is so much better than a lot of these plastic shields which we saw in the past. I really like this. Which also lets me to the point that I really dislike the fact that the memory cover is made out of plastic. Because you can clearly see it when I'm just looking at this. The way the plastic reflects the light is just completely different than like metal. That's why this sticks out, but not in a positive way. On the other hand, I also like how it looks. I, j I first thought this is a complete trash feature, that this is completely stupid to use. Turned out it's not that bad. Thermally, the impact was 3 degrees Celsius, which is something you can pretty much neglect. It won't make any difference if your memory sticks are sitting at 49 or 52 degrees Celsius. That just, it just doesn't matter. Visually, you will have to decide if it's something for you or not. The thermal armor of the M.2, like this thin heat pipe cooler for your M.2 drive is amazing. The thermal performance is so much better than even like the included M.2 cooler of the Corsair MP600 XT SSD, which is already a fairly big block for cooling. If you would compare it with an SSD without any cooling, this makes a huge difference. So the thermal guard, thermal guard, yeah, not sure why I called it thermal armor, but those marketing terms. Anyway, you know what I mean. This thing is, is very, very good. Price-wise, the board is 800 euro here in Germany, which is expensive. It is expensive and it's not an extreme overclocking board. I would not use this with like Allen 2 or dry ice simply because it's missing essential features for this purpose. But I also think that Gigabyte did not market this board for this purpose. Just by looking how the debug LED is not directly attached to the board and you would have to remove like those covers. The CMOS button is like hidden, it's not that easy to access. Things like that don't make it really an extreme overclocking board. Talking about liquid nitrogen and dry ice. If you attempt to do very high overclocking on like ambient or even sub-ambient, like chiller overclocking and everything like that, the board will perform very well. I don't think that you will have any trouble with this board. But still it's 800 euro. Going over to our benchmark data, those were pretty surprising to me. And I just want to ask you if you have seen some different sources of FPS per watt comparisons, please let me know. Don't link, don't link on my YouTube channel because links will be automatically blocked. But just put the name or the title of the, of the test of the website and I will try to research it. Because these results looked so much better than I expected. The 12900K beat the 5950X depending on the game by like 10 to almost 50% in Far Cry 6 1080p high. Which was quite surprising to me. I already thought or expected that the 12900K would be very efficient and beat the 5950X in several titles, but that was more than I expected. And I also used the 5950X on the Dark Hero, which allowed my 5950X to boost to 5 GHz, which is a lot and should give very good performance for the 5950X. Yeah, all the boards were running the latest BIOS and everything, just stock, optimized default settings. Not sure. Please let me know about feedback to the testing data. Hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time. Bye-bye.